We'll resume our discussion of detailing the marble run sample, talking about copying parts and inserting external parts. So here's the, here's the situation. We have this marble run, and it has uh, all the parts that we need right now are defined, but there's a dowel pin that needs to be exerted, inserted from uh, outside definitions, plus there's some internal parts, the brace and the barrier, that should be copied. Uh, we'll have two copies in the final assembly, but we don't need to create brand new geometry for those. We can simply copy what we have. So the general scheme is we can duplicate a part, relocate it, and then attempt to create a joint uh, it to associate it with geometry. If we do this well, then the attachment at the joint will be associative, and as features move around, it will correctly uh, uh, be, be repositioned to match. Um, it's possible to capture a position that's absolute in space, that is not associative, and then that will create trouble if we try to modify things. So let's see how this might work. Let's start with the cross brace. So just to begin with, I'm going to just uh, uh, pick just the the relevant parts to look at, which would be the foot, the strut, and the cross, ba cross base, and isolate those just for, oh, we actually had an isolation running. We're going to isolate those just for um, just for making it easier to see what we're doing. Uh, note that if you have really complex assemblies, it's possible to create complicated subsets of parts to view in one set that can make it easier to switch between uh, views and kind of tunnel down to your geometry when you're trying to see things in a complicated way. But for this assembly, we don't need such a thing. So the first thing we'll do is we're going to pick the cross brace and just do a copy. And now we're going to go to the top level of the drawing and we're going to do paste. We're not going to do paste new. Paste new would create a new component that's independent and would allow a separate modification. We're going to create simply a new, I'm sorry, paste it as a plain placed. And what we get is a duplicate of the part that we can move. And here we're going to kind of move it up here and just sort of see it in place. And we're going to approximately get it located. Um, but of course, we want it to be precisely located. So we're going to use features to do that. So there we have it um, in space. And uh, if we look at the design history, that's a copy paste operation that produced a new object. And it currently has a location attached to it. Um, but that has not yet been, uh, well, we'll see that we need to sort of be careful how we commit that into the timeline. The first thing to note is we want to have basically the, um, we want to, in order to do precision moves, we're going to use a special operator called align, which uh, what it does is uh, allow you to specify some features. And say I'm going to say now the inside face of my slot and the inside face of my half lap, if I can pick that appropriately, yes. And um, it'll try to move them into position. And it made them coplanar. That's not a bad start. Um, and we can just accept that. Now, it hasn't created any, any entries in the design history. It's just moved the kind of transient location of the part. And we can tell, because we look up in the position area here, um, there's a new option for uh, revert. So we just created a change in position that we can still revert, and or in, instead we can capture it and make a definitive entry in the timeline for that move. But we haven't finished aligning. We're going to instead now do effectively sort of con successive constraint here and try another align operation, this time on uh, one face of the um, brace with respect to an inside face of the slot, and moved it now into this configuration. Now here's the trick. At this point, if I, I do, I'll do, I will need to capture the position, but if I only capture the position, it would simply define a location space that wouldn't be associative. And we should test that just to make sure that's really true. So I'm going to allow it now to capture position. We get a new entry in the design history that represents a repositioning of that part. Just as, as an experiment here now, if I go up to the change parameters and I change my overall uh, slope from 15 to 20, we'll see that things got kind of wonky. The slot moved with the, the edge of the, um, of the new slope of the strut brace there, but the part is still fixed in space at the wrong location. So that, that's sort of a demonstration that this, the, and I'm just undoing that change parameter there. That's an illustration of how simply fixing in space isn't enough to make it associative to future design changes. So now we have to think about how we might create a joint here. And there's, uh, basically we want a rigid joint. That's a joint that has no extra freedoms. It's just a six axis joint just to provide location, but we kind of carefully need to s pick which features we're gonna, uh, we're gonna join it to. So to begin this process, I'm going to go back now and do one additional thing, which is, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm just going to go ahead and try to begin this process and see how it goes. So I'm going to make some of the other parts invisible again, just to 
um, get us started on this process and think just about this strut. Now, I'm gonna, I wanna begin a joint. So I'm gonna say, go to the uh, assemble menu and we're gonna begin as built joint. And now I'm gonna carefully select uh, the two components I want, which are gonna be my cross brace two here and my strut. Those are the things I'm joining. And uh, we're gonna try this first and see how it goes, making an as built joint, which uses their current locations to define the joint. So that actually created the joint, but I think it's gonna not give us yet what we care about. Let's go back and look at the strut. So we see now we have a new element in the feature tree, which is a rigid joint. It's a thing. It's an element that defines relationship. Now, now to see if this was associative, let's see if it worked. I think it won't be actually yet associative. So we're gonna go back and once again, change the slope to 20 degrees. And lo and behold, that didn't work either. The problem is, is that the as-built joint uses the current locations, and I believe it just references the current offset between their centers and the actual like locations in the space of the parts didn't move, just individual features inside the parts. So that didn't solve our problem. So I'm gonna undo my slope change and I'm gonna delete the rigid joint. So now we're back where we were a second ago. So now we're gonna try a different kind of joint. We're gonna try a rigid joint that's actually between faces and see if that will make us, uh, give, give us an associative result. So I'm gonna turn off the strut. I'm gonna go to the, the uh, um, assemble menu, and this time instead of using an as built joint, I'm going to use a regular joint. And now I get a little bit more freedom to pick details. So I can actually now pick a joint origin as the center of a face. And I'm picking a location and an orientation in the center of a face as, a, as one kind of reference on component one. So that's on the brace. Now I'm going to turn off the brace and turn on the strut, and now we're going to try to provide a mating. Uh, sort of uh, feature on the opposite face here, which will be exactly there. That's the, that's the, nope, that's still not it. Uh, there, that's the face I care about. So now if, I, if you look at the menu here, there's a lot more detail here. I've, I'm using the simple mode where I've picked the snap point on one face and the, and the opposite snap point on the opposite face. And, um, He wants an alignment. Now that did create a joint, although it's a little bit offset, it's not exactly what we want. It's still not exactly what we want. Um, um, and, but it will now at least do one test and see, is it associative? The snap points are still not exactly right. I think I got the corner somehow instead of the center, and that didn't get me what we wanted. But let's go ahead and uh, bring up the change parameters menu one other time here and say uh, 20 degrees. No. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, it did move. It, it moved at least with the part, but it's still not located exactly right in space. So we have it at least associated, but not there's an offset error that we can come back and fix. Let's try one more time here. So we're going to go back and reopen this uh, rigid joint and edit the joint, get our menu back. And now um, I'm going to, uh, I, I'm confident that I had the right snap point on the uh, first um, part, but I'm not confident I had the snap, the snap point right on the strut itself. So we're going to look at that now. Um, so if I go to the snap, I'm going to go ahead and repick the simple snap point of this and there, that I think will be the joint origin. Let's try that. And we're close, but there's still a, a, a rotational error. There is a freedom here that's not accounted for, which is that two points on two planes locate an axis, but don't include a rotation. And this is a case where the, this particular joint is actually only five axes, not six. It's a kind of fundamental problem with uh, the nature of um, Fusion 360, that there's a, there's a, there, you have to have this extra parameter for the joint alignment that isn't associative. In this case, it's not gonna bug us because we don't, we're not gonna actually try to change the rotation of this part. Uh, but that does actually show that the model has a gap in that it's not fully six axis associative. And now as one last step here, we're gonna go change parameters and we're gonna change the angle back to 20 degrees and see that, yes, I can change the slope of my play field that edge moves and the cross brace in that location moves along with it. 
So it is, it is fully associative. And I'm going to back out that change parameter. So that's an example where correctly joined, uh, you can create parts that will move in space with the features that they should be attached to and maintain your logical relationships within the assembly, even as other elements move around. So we're coming along here. Now we just need to do this, something similar. Oh, it looks like I somehow managed to screw up my cross space, but, or my barriers, but completely. Something was unstably defined, and it looks like my barrier part has now managed to lose a lot of its geometry. So at this point, I'm going to let the camera roll, but I'm going to edit out some fixes and try to figure out what's going on. I'm back from fixing up the barrier part. Yeah, I got it inverted for some unknown reason. I think there's something unstable in the sketch, or the plane maybe changed its directional sign. And so the sketch uh, was perhaps under constrained and kind of solved to a different solution. I mean, the sort of meta lesson here is that uh, defining sketch constraints is a very powerful way of specifying your design intent and capturing the relationships in the drawing. But if there's an ambiguity in the solution, the, the computer can solve for a different outcome than you expect. And sometimes that can happen down the line and something else changes and it resolves it and it finds a different fixed point in the solution of the equations. Um, then things can do strange things. So one, the, the, the general habit I have is try to fully constrain sketches in logical ways as much as possible so that there is less room for the machine to uh, find alternate pathways as it goes forward. So I'm back to having a viable barrier. And all on the way, I also just slightly changed the dimensioning scheme so it's now associated to the ends of the uh, play field. The, and so it'll always have a small gap in from the edge of the top and bottom as well. And we should see the effect of that. But the matter at hand is to try to make a copy of the barrier on the opposite side in a mirrored position. The parts should be the parts were drawn in a way such that they can be an identical copy of the part can be used in both positions. So I'm going to find here the barrier. I'm going to do the copy and do a paste. And I'll get my new copy, barrier two. It's a linked copy, so it should have the same geometry. And I'll kind of drag it kind of you know, roughly to position here. Although we see now it has some rotation angles that uh, give it a slightly trickier kind of orientation. There we go, find the right orientation there. That's sort of roughly right. And then we're going to try using a line to see if we can get that to be precise. And then we're going to try using a joint to see if we can get it to be associative as we like. So uh, first, um, I'm going to sort of see, do I have a center point? Yeah, I do have a center point feature here. Um, and hopefully, actually, this is a case where I may have to go back now and create some auxiliary features and sketches to really get the result I want. Because if you recall, um, I've already modeled features kind of on size so that the um, there might be some slight overlap in the model, but that actually makes it a little harder to do the constraint at this point because uh, not everything is exactly coplanar. Things connect, or the, some of these points are actually going to intersect the bodies of the other parts. And so I have to think more about the logical relationship in terms of sketch geometry. So I'm going to, in order to fix this, I'm actually going to give myself some features to work with. I'm going to briefly reactivate the play field and just create a, an auxiliary sketch here on the, on the top of it, which I'm just going to use for, for creating new geometry for, uh, for using and referencing uh, to get a kind of precise reference. And if I... Um, I snap to the right points here. I'm going to constrain my line here to the vertices of the of the features themselves here, right? And then uh, create a, a just a point um, at the midpoint that we can use for um, a reference as the center point for both the joint and for alignment purposes. Let's add a few more uh, features to our extra sketch to allow us an easier time of trying to position this barrier part when we do the joining. So I'm going to reopen my sketch here. And um, we're, remember, we're just adding extra annotations that will give us some geometry to reference when we're trying to, uh, to line things up. So one thing I do is I can actually place an extra uh, construction line here uh, along the central axis of that um, 
of that slot just to give us something. I'm, I'm kind of guessing here a little bit what we might need. Um, but I think that the fact is that our original part was drawn with a vertical plane and we're drawing this now with a horizontal plane means that we want to make sure we have um, uh, at least some long, uh, well-defined axes to use for, um, for lining things up. And we're once again going to create a point at the, at the midpoint of that line as well. And let's just create an axis between the centers. I think that actually could turn out to be quite useful here. This is all extra geometry, but it's derived from the existing geometry. So it should be associative and it'll move with as, as the other things move. And let's see if that's enough to get the job done. So I'm going to finish the sketch and go back to... We're back at the problem of trying to join the barrier with the playfield in a way that will be associative under part uh, shape and dimensional changes. And I'll admit that I just added out a bunch of false starts in this before I kind of got it right. Um, the key is uh, with the join, we need two points that match in the same orientation at the same orientation in space. So logically for this part, they should be along the long axis of the part so that any freedom that's left that's un unassociative is the rotation that we don't care about. It turned out that solving that involved carefully constructing a very short construction line back in the barrier sketch, the original sketch, to give us a snap point right where we want it. This seems like an unfortunate property of Fusion 360 that sometimes doing the join where you have to in one step rigidly attach two parts requires uh, carefully considering how to add ex extra sketch features just to get the points that you need. But let's see how the final result looks. So I mean, I have just the side barrier and the playfield visible kind of positioned close to each other viewed from the bottom. I'm going to start my join. Now, as I move around the cursor, there's a whole bunch of possible sketch uh, sort of snap positions that I really want to find is the midpoint of the construction line along the root of the tab. And that will have, if I get just right there, there it is. That is oriented along the long axis of the bottom face of the barrier. And it's in the, in the center, center point of the tab at the root. So that's a, that's a well-defined position in orientation. Now on the, on the uh, play field part, there's a sketch line right there. And if I can snap exactly to it, I get this, the comparable part on the play field. This is right coplanar with the top surface of the play field, right in the middle of the slot. And if I join those two, then my parts will be associated at the right location. And that ends up, because it has a well-defined axis, it lines it up fully along the axis that I care about, and I can say OK. So this is an example where it can be tricky to find precisely the way to get two parts to join together, but done well then, you get an associative design that will be robust to, to sort of additional changes um, of design. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, go back, uh, unisolate, get all our parts back. Um, we're going to save a quick version here um, and just say um, adding, adding second barrier just for our reference. Okay, so let's go ahead and bring up the change parameters window and just see what happens if we change something. So I can tilt it and um, it all seems to tilt together very nicely. Okay, that was great. And I can uh, go back to change parameters. And now let's just think that actually will change the internal angles a little bit. If I widen the top of the play field, I make that 120, it worked. The top of the play field widened, the planes moved with the new uh, sort of parallel features, the barrier parts were regenerated appropriately, and the, and the joint, the mirror joint worked. It kind of, it held together. Um, now if I try to uh, lengthen the play field, 150, let's go to 175, um, that also worked. My barriers got longer, although you see that I, I under constrained the top uh, fillet radius there. And so the geometry changed as it moved. So there is still something under constrained in the barrier part that I should probably go back and fix. But that's not a bad sort of design change. And that does keep some kind of revision there together. All right, so that's actually uh, coming along. Let's think now about the final dowel pin features. Um, and these are McMaster, these, these are in the course kit and they're available for McMaster Car. So let's just briefly review how we might install those. So if we go to the um, course kit page and we scroll down through the inventory, there's a wooden dowel pin and we can find its McMaster Car park number from the URL. Um, there we go, wooden dowel pin. McMaster part and it has this number. So back in Fusion now, I'm gonna say insert McMaster Car part and it'll pop up a dialog 
and we can search for that part number at, at the McMaster Car website, go to the product detail page, scroll down to we see the CAD sources, um, select a step file. Step is a, is a neutral CAD format with good shape information that is a good choice for import and really the only choice into Fusion. And we say save, and instead of saving it to disk, it will simply bring it in as a linked part, in, or as an external part into the assembly. And now we have this pin here in place. Now we don't have, we can always, it is actually just geometry that we can manipulate. Um, so we can, if we need to add extra features and things to it, I hope I don't need to. Um, so just in, in the interest of time here, we're gonna do basically a simple kind of uh, um, join where I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna create a joint. I'm gonna capture the position. I'm gonna pick the bottom center of the dowel pin and I'm gonna pick the bottom center of my hole here. And we get a, uh, a location and we get a dowel pin in place. So that's probably not quite as deep as I'd physically install it, but it's tolerable. It kind of at least shows the location and that should get us um, a part as we need. Um, just to do that a second time, I'm gonna copy my part, paste it at the top level, get a second copy, just kind of move it out of the way a little bit. And we're basically gonna repeat exactly that same operation. I'm gonna, um, it's okay, I'm gonna start a new joint. I'm gonna pick the bottom center there on my play field. Ah, okay, so this actually is the case where we actually can't go any deeper. The, um, the strut covers the bottom of the play field at location, so that's as far as it will actually pound in. So it turns out my trace there is not so far off. I'm gonna momentarily hide the strut so I can see that hole again. On a Mac, I'm gonna hold down the command key as I pick the circle, and that will make sure I, I'm picking the feature I care about when I pick the center and I'll get my uh, joint, my rigid joint, with the pin located at that feature. And that should be associative to geometry because it's defined by the feature, not, not a location in space. So final step now, this is uh, now I think, uh, I don't know if it's, it's not fully beautified. I would definitely go back and just do um, kind of overall design and aesthetic fixes, but at least we have a viable, a viable design model here. It's the first sort of fully viable design for this assembly that is this, um, kind of silly executive toy marble run. Um, so let's save that. Um, I'm just gonna call it all parts to see everything is in there. Now let's briefly go over DXF export. We're not gonna be actually laser cutting this particular uh, part, but we should at least understand how it's done uh, because those of you who are gonna laser cut in the future will need this, this knowledge. I'm gonna um, isolate the play field. Um, and basically what it boils down to is um, Fusion 360 can export a sketch as a two-dimensional file called a DXF file that has the laser cutter cut lines in it. In general, this involves creating a new sketch. So we're gonna create a new sketch, but it's gonna be entirely ge re derived geometry. So I'm gonna create, I'm just gonna pick the top face here. That's a reasonable face for this. Let's say create sketch. And now when I, I'm gonna do a projection, what I'm gonna pick is the entire face and I'm gonna project that into my new sketch here to get sketch lines that correspond to actual physical edges of the part. Um, and then um, that's, that's all I need for that particular sketch. Um, and then I'm gonna just briefly hide my other sketches so that it's sort of visible what I've done here. I'm gonna even hide the body. You see it's cut lines and points. The points won't, be, uh, won't cause the laser cutter to do anything, it'll just be the edges. I can actually go ahead and name that as well. We haven't renamed anything, but it's actually in this case very helpful to rename my sketch. Uh, I'll just call it laser cutter. Um, just so I know what it is. Now, if I right click on the sketch, there's an option, save as DXF. There really aren't any options. That'll just do it. I can uh, pick a name, I can say uh, play field, and it will, uh, it'll save it. Um, please note DXF files don't have units attached to them. My part's in millimeters, so the DXF file is implicitly in millimeters. Our laser cutters work in millimeters. Um, the import can be set to either inches or millimeters, so you can rescale it on import. If you find after, after you've imported your file, it's not at the scale you expected, um, it's easy to just delete that, change the import parameters and re-import it. I recommend that over rescan the part because it'll, it'll save on numerical precision, you'll get a better result. So um, I'm gonna briefly, I'll probably edit out a moment here, but I'm gonna open up the DXF and see if we can visualize it. So I save this DXF to my local uh, computer system and I am going to open it. On my particular machine, the opening is actually done with eDrawings, which is a SOLIDWORKS product, but it does let us open a DXF file and just see that the lines are, as we expect, 
Um, and so at least we know that we have like a reasonable export of the geometry. And that, those lines cut out of plywood would make our play field. That's an appropriate part. So just to summarize, come back and summarize, let's sort of uh, unice everything and sort of see everything one last time here. Um, in this final stage of things, we, um, We um, did some part duplication to make additional copies without uh, redrawing them. We uh, worked hard to make uh, associative joints that would position a part with respect to part geometry in a way that would be stable over changes. We saw some failures of constraint geometry as things went awry. We imported a part from McMaster Car catalog and inserted it into the assembly, and we uh, created DXF output. So that would be a complete solution for this problem. And I hope that's enough to give you a lot of insight into how parametric CAD works. It is time consuming, but if it's done well, you get a part that is uh, hard to draw perhaps, but captures your thinking very clearly and supports a lot of modification.